Do you want to sidestep that long waiting list for the new Toyota you've got your heart set on? We'll stand by for details on our cunning plan. Yes, it's time to strap in for another edition of the Cars Guide podcast, the show that takes you beyond the test drive. This is episode 198, Jumping the Toyota Q. I'm Cars Guide Deputy Editor James, and joining me to discuss this sneaky brand hopping workaround is Cars Guide News Editor Tung. Great to be back. And key contributor, Mr. David Morley. Yay. <laughs> we'll, key, key contributor. <laughs> Lost keys contributor. <laughs> we'll shine a light into distant recesses of the Cars Guide garage, looking back on our hero cars and memorable drives. Then we'll dive into your feedback. YouTubers, if you want to plot your own adventure, you can jump ahead courtesy of the time codes in the notes below, and you can click on the chapter markers in the timeline. So let's hit the start button. And it's uh, from our good mate, Byron, wrote a story this week, which uh, has created a bit of interest. Um, Now, I should preface this by we have nothing against Toyota, uh, but clearly new car supply is an issue at the moment. And what Byron's saying is that the the 2020s so far have really turned into a decade of waiting. Um, We're waiting for normality. We're waiting to see our friends and loved ones. And we're waiting for new cars. And with um, 20% of the market, Toyota is obviously out there in front. There's a lot of demand for those cars. But the irony is this semiconductor and by extension, uh, microchip um, shortage has meant that some of their plants are close to idling. They're just not able to produce the cars. So there are long waiting lists. Um, And if you're tired of waiting for your Toyota, and we've got a few to cover, he's put up some alternate options that may have a new car in your driveway or garage uh, quicker than than you might have uh, thought possible for your Toyota. So let's get going. The first one that he's touched on is the RAV4. Now, obviously, it's a hugely popular car. It, it, it um, was our um, car of the year a couple of years ago during its launch phase. Um, but um, Byron has put up an altogether different option, which is the Mitsubishi Outlander, not the decade old uh, version that we're all well familiar with, but the new upcoming Outlander, which should be here, Tung, I believe, in around November. And yeah, yeah. Pr- pretty much nothing has carried over from the, from the vehicle before it. Do you, do you know much about this car? Uh, the Outlander, yeah. I mean, yeah. it's a significant sort of update on it. And I think Byron has chosen um, the Outlander specifically because, you know, we all know how popular RAV4 Hybrid is. You know, everyone wants that, you know, fuel sipping engine. Um, wait lists have blown, you know, well out. You know, at, at times, you know, it was, what, 12 months or so before you could get one. Um, and you think that every other car manufacturer would kind of jump in on that bandwagon and come up with their own sort of electrified mid-size SUV to take on the RAV4. But um, Outlander seems to be, you know, the only uh, viable alternative at this point. Yeah. New Tucson uh, it does not come with a hybrid. Um, next generation Mazda CX-5 is still a while away. Uh, we're just about to see the launch of Kia Sportage and, you know, rumours are that we might get sort of a plug-in or some sort of electrification in that car, but we'll have to wait and see. So, Really, if you want an electrified midsize SUV that's not a Rav Four, you really got to look at well, da- Dave. Dave, Dave, to me, I'm I'm not sure if if you agree, but I, to me, it just seems like Toyota's long play, long investment in hybrid through Prius, and then playing that out into the the rest of their range now, is really starting to pay off for them. You know well, that there's so much demand, people are ready to hop onto a hybrid, and and they're in the box seat. I've been saying for a long time, I think the new uh, the new RAV hybrid and the Corolla hybrid will be a lot of families' first hybrid, a lot of Australia's first toe in the water with a hybrid. And it makes sense. I mean, why wouldn't you? The, the, the cost on top of a RAV to get the hybrid RAV is a couple of grand, you know, two and a half grand. Do you want fries with that? Well, yeah. hell, if <laughs> exactly. If they're free, yes. yeah. Of course yeah, I do. So, and a soft serve ice cream as well. Thank you. <laughs> that makes all sorts of sense. So I think that'll be um, that that will happen. And and the only problem with that is that you know we've got this this supply problem. Um, yeah. The Outlander that that will be available in a, a PHEV, won't it? It yeah. will. Yeah. Yep. Which which is something the Rav doesn't offer. Hmm. Um, so for I think, now. <laughs> and th- true. True. Uh, so that maybe that's a that's a 
beyond just be, being able to physically get your hands on one, that yes. might be a, a good sort of argument for Mitsubishi to mount because it is even more future proof than, than the RAV. Well, the other thing, the point Byron makes is that it's your five plus two seating is available in the Outlander as well. So if you want that occasional way back seating for, you know, the kids or whatever, that's a big advantage as well. Mm. Um, and and a conditional as it is, a 10-year warranty is pretty compelling uh, for any Mitsubishi uh, Outlander, Not no exception there. So it does have a lot going for it. And he's saying it might be a canny move to just get in touch with your Mitsubishi dealer um, now. And, and if yeah. you can uh, get you get yourself in that queue, you won't be waiting for as long as you might be for a RAV4. I, I, think, I think probably the biggest impediment to, to the Outlander at the moment is the fact that everyone thinks Mitsubishi's range is so old. And to a certain extent, they're dead, they're dead right. No, how old's the ASX now? I mean, it's voting, isn't it? <laughs> yes. Well, it's had. That's right. It's had some uh, cosmetic work done. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Um, but but its age is hard to hide. Yeah. Yeah. So there is that perception that Mitsubishi is a out of money and b as a result uh, recycling model lines and platforms. And mm. yes. Okay, the new Outlander is going is not is not in that basket. But what do you do about that perception? Yes, and particularly when people want a Rav Four because of the perception of Toyota to a large extent. That's true. I mean, talk about investments. Toyota has, wow, you know, over a period of decades invested in its retail network, in its reputation for reliability and uh, the service pricing, and all of those things that just attract uh, the the mass of people towards that brand. Surely, just attract is a very important word because it is. It then becomes that 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 halo becomes an emotional response and the other thing about buying a toyota is you don't have to explain it when the neighbors come over to your driveway not allowed to at the moment to have a look at your at your new car oh it's a toyota you bought one of those you park an outlander there there's going to be questions (laughs) yeah that's true that's true i mean it just also comes down to convenience right there's just so many more toyota dealerships like yeah it's just that much more convenient for you to go out you know, to a Toyota dealership and to service at a Toyota dealership, you know, why would you buy any other brand that you have to travel, you know, twice as long to get to? Well, I mean, full transparency here, regular viewers and listeners might know, we as a family bought a Corolla hybrid um, brand new a little while ago. Um, and the service pricing is just so extraordinarily low um, relative to to others. That's a big draw card uh, as well as that broader broader reputation um so that's that's this family's first hybrid and probably you know, won't be the last yeah, but, I, I think that's an increasingly important point too as cars get more complex and people mm. get more and more scared of the tech how yeah. many times have you heard people say oh yes but yeah it's a hybrid but how long will the batteries last well the warranty's for 10 years so you know, yeah um, yeah yeah so at least so that. that that take uh demystifying that stuff and taking that fear away yeah is, very important, particularly for a conservative buyer, which fundamentally your mid-sized SUV hybrid buyer is, you know, they've, they've got a brain, but yep. they're fundamentally a conservative buyer. True. And it's interesting also, Dave, the point you made about Mitsubishi and perceptions of, look, they've, they've got the ass out of their pants and they just can't develop the new models. Um, in that try try relationship with Nissan and Renault and Mitsubishi and um, all of the furor that's gone in that business and keeping each brand to its own lane in terms of the contributions it makes to new product. Mitsubishi seems to be the lesser partner there. It's all about Nissan and it's all about Renault. And then there's, oh yeah, Mitsubishi will do its thing. It's, it's, uh, it's almost feels like they're in limbo, maybe not quite, but, but they're I, the lesser, yeah. lesser partner in that. I don't know that they're lesser partner. I think they've actually been a bit smarter about it. Okay. Perhaps. Um, I'm concerned. I would be concerned as if, if I was a Nissan buyer with the with the Renault influence on that product line for the last decade. It's not. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And you know, then there was the whole schmozzle with uh, Carlos and and the Japanese government, and you know that mud sticks. Sorry. Yeah. yeah. And I think I think Mitsubishi's actually been a bit clever and firewalled itself away from that a little bit. Okay, that's an interesting point of view. And points, by the way, for the use of the word schmozzle. Thank you. <laughs> Um, now, okay. Well, that's, that, like me. <laughs> that's good. So let's move on to the next one. And this is interesting because it's a Toyota model that hasn't even arrived yet. Um, however, we're predicting that demand will be such that, you know, it's late next year that you'd be waiting for your, your Corolla Cross to arrive. So Byron's thought a little bit laterally in that part of the market and said, 
if you want a small kind of car-based crossover style vehicle, which the Corolla Cross is and will be once it hits the market, what about the Qashqai? And again, your mind goes to a, a model that's been with us for some time, in this case, a 2014 vintage. But he's talking about an all new third generation um, model that's winning big plaudits in the UK, where it's mm. already uh, been on sale for some time. It's improved in terms of performance and efficiency. The interior's had a big makeover, uh, the quality and the refinement. And there's going to be an e-power EV version that will come not long after. So he's suggesting that as a, as a strong alternative to your, your Corolla Cross. What do you guys make of that? That is an absolutely solid choice. Um, yeah. You know, I, I'm so I'm excited quiet. for the new Qashqai. <laughs> <laughs> Good. I'm so excited for the new Qashqai. I think it's it's the right, you know, it's the start of Nissan's, well, I guess you could say the Duke was, but it's the start of Nissan's new sort of product refresh. Um, All right. We'll get Qashqai, we'll get X-Trail, we'll get Pathfinder. Um, but what excites me the most about Qashqai is e-power. That powertrain, I think, has the potential to be really, really, um, you know, exciting here. So right. the way it works is it pairs, a, I believe it's a 1.5 litre petrol engine um, that just generates electricity for the battery. Yeah. That petrol engine never drives the wheels. So mm. essentially it feels like you're driving an EV, but you don't have the long recharge time. It's that type of range extender, um, yeah. you know, philosophy. Yeah. Yep. Yep. Old vault. It's 10 years yes, late. Yes, exactly. <laughs> and don't you see a lot of those Holden vaults out there? I wonder I wonder what they're bringing in the used market these maybe, days. Maybe the vault was uh, too ahead of its time, you know? Oh, maybe it wasn't ready oh, for something well, like that. Go. Well, look, okay, I see your point. But from my point of view, and, and bear in mind, I'm playing devil's advocate here because our job is to assess cars, you yep. know, purely on their merits. And I think a lot of the reason people would want a Corolla Cross is because they want a Toyota. Okay, <laughs> all that stuff we've talked about, you know, the brand building, the emotion about it, the great the, point, the safety of that purchase, the the not having to explain to your, to your neighbours what the hell, what you you know, what drugs you're on, all those things. <laughs> yeah, I hate those conversations. <laughs> <laughs> None of those things is normally for your doctor. Yeah. Uh, don't apply to the cash guy. Sorry, they don't. Mm. They just mm. don't. I mean, no one's going to buy a car they can't spell. Just for starters. <laughs> <laughs> Regardless of how good the new one is, it's going to yeah. carry the reputation of the old one. It's sure. Good. Yeah. Yes. Uh, that's yeah, that's why, a good. That's it's why a good car point. companies change the names of models because they they go, well, we can't call it that because look what a disaster that was. Yeah. Well, well I mean, the, they the, go back to Duallis. <laughs> <laughs> well, the 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 conventional wisdom in marketing terms is that consumers buy brands. You know, they don't buy products, and yeah. and they they start off with a brand that they can trust and that reputation then underpins their choice in terms of the product that they go for. Um, and at the lower end, you know, the entry point of the market, that may not be the case so much. People are, are coming in and making their own, their first new car purchase. So all, all bets are off, you know, but once people are in that rhythm of buying new cars, brands count for a lot. So I, I, I absolutely hear what you're saying, Dave. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Well, Notwithstanding that, let's move on to another Toyota model. Um, now, this one, it's you know pretty, it's pretty much top of the heap. It's it's uh, in recent times been the top selling vehicle um, in the country. That's varied a little bit lately. Um, so it's been around now in its current form uh, for a little while. There've been some improvements, etc. But Byron's saying, look, maybe you should be thinking about the 2023 Ford Ranger, which has been battling away with the Hilux in that really hot Ute uh, segment anyway. Uh, but this next one, it's <laughs> he's positioning it as the only Australian-designed uh, Ute that you can buy in this market. And, of course, uh, it's been engineered here as well, which is an interesting point. Um, and you're going to be – he's saying get in touch with your Ford dealer because that when Tung, refresh my memory, when is that due to arrive? Do you do you know that it's it's kind of up in the air, isn't it? We're it is. we're thinking it might be during the latter part of next year. Yeah, look, I I think uh, officially, you know, they've not said anything, but yeah, you can kind of speculate mid to you know mid to late next year. Right, and and given that, Byron's saying. Buy, buy the current one anyway. He he sees it as um, a better a better option even yeah. in your current Ranger, and yeah. uh, the, the current Ranger has heaps going for it as well. I, I mm. don't know, Dave. Have you experienced either the of those ones, the, yeah, the yeah. Hilux uh, and look, Ranger? I, I think, um, I mean, I, I don't disagree. 
uh, I think it comes under the broad heading of no brainer. The, the Ranger has always been mm. a viable competitor to the Hilux. And uh, it's, all, you know, it's been one and two now for so long. The Ranger is a good vehicle. There's no two ways about that. Um, mm. I, my only concern with any of those vehicles, and, and, it, and it doesn't really hold up, it's just a personal thing. The whole common rail diesel thing scares me. Uh, the whole right. TPF thing. I think 10 years down a the track, there's going to be a whole lot of cars getting scrapped. No better reason than the fact that they just don't work anymore. Is, the, is, the, is it the, the nature of the common rail, the high pressure kind of yeah, system? I think, or, or? Yeah. Um, it's that. It, it's also uh, keeping the things to within emissions tolerances. You know, the DPF is not a low maintenance piece of equipment as it turns out, you know. Yes. Uh, and, and these are work trucks. They do get a hard time. It's kind of. I just wonder about the appropriateness of that tech. Um, yes. You know, obviously, it's, it's it's how they it's how they how they get two hundred horsepower out of a two point eight liter. Great engine, point. You know? It's a great it's, point. It's it's how yeah. you do it. But what are the ramifications? What are the knock on effects down the track? And I've got a yeah. I think wrecking yards are going to be full of these things pretty soon. Do you know it was interesting? I was watching a doco on Tilly. I think it was either Netflix or Stan, one of those streaming services, and. Um, it was about the nature of precision and how modern engineering seems to be driving relentlessly towards ultimate precision. And they're talking about the, a, a fault in an aero engine that caused a commercial airliner to almost crash. And it was a very fine uh, piece within the engine that was down to such a fine tolerance that if there was the least bit of imperfection, you had a catastrophic failure. Yep. So, you know, there's a lot to be said for reliability works okay, but it's not your ultimate down to the nth degree kind of precise thing. And that probably goes for automotive yeah. as well, I suppose. It does. And I think consumers understand that because the Hilux has never been, not that the Hilux hasn't had its own problems with DPFs and things, but the Hilux has never had the highest specific output or the, the most True. kilowatts or the most... Mm, it's true. always sat back a bit. And that hasn't bothered people because... It's done the job. Yes. You know? um, yeah, you can, that's true. I understand if Ferrari comes out with an 800 horsepower car, <laughs> then Maserati has to come out with 801. I get that. Yeah, it's yeah, an arms right. race. Yeah. But I don't think work utes necessarily fall into that category. I don't, I no. don't think that's I don't think that's a genuine, genuinely appropriate approach to take for a manufacturer. I think they need to ensure the, the fit for purpose aspect of things the only yeah. thing i would say there is that there's been a bit of a a, a kind of shift from your car-based unibody utes into body on frame pickups like hilux and ranger so there are some people that are more focused on the rims and the suspension and maybe you know tuning their cars up a little bit that that aren't they're not work trucks then they're, they're your kind of lifestyle family transport as well so there's a True bit enough. of that but but prime primarily they're still about, you know, their reliability and toughness. Yeah, they wouldn't exist if, if they weren't work trucks. Now, there's a company up... I mean, I work in a, an industrial complex because... Yeah, you're them. an industrial kind of guy. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> exactly. They don't mind the odd explosion here. Um, <laughs> That's right. There's a business up the front that used to modify Commodores and Falcons, and now they do exclusively Rangers, Hiluxes. There you go. Isn't that mm -hmm. interesting? Mm. That, now, I unsurprisingly, I also have a view on that. This is the first time in the history of Australia, Australia as a motoring nation, this last few years is the first time that the dynamics and primary safety of the average car park has reduced, has gone back. Okay, okay. And it's gone back because, because of that. everyone's buying dual cab utes. Utes, now, yes. I've got no problem with dual cab utes, but I don't think they're particularly smart family cars. Uh, and they, don't, they do have compromises in terms of their tyres, yep. their, their weight, uh, brakes center of gravity their brakes uh yep. their, their, the basic construction limits their dynamic abilities so the car park dynamically has, has come backwards it's a very interesting and, point and, and, and that sort of disturbs me a little bit because i think for, for, for our, them that, that sh there's better choices for so many people who are buying those things um for our younger viewers and listeners a drum brake is an enclosed type of brake where shoes press outwards rather than uh, uh yeah anyway sorry point made you know that the, 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 there are uh that's a really interesting point dave something hadn't occurred to me sorry Tom, go ahead so dave would you would you like to see things like ford maverick 
uh, Hyundai Santa Cruz, which are based on, you know, car and SUV platforms. Would you like to see those sorts of cars arrive? Do you think, I think that would fix the problem, you know, and I, I, give families a, a, a better alternative? Problem's a strong word. If you consider <laughs> what I'm saying to be a problem, then then yes. Look, I still drive a car-based ute. I've got a 2003, I think it is, Commodore ute. That's what I use day to day. Mm. Yeah. Because it can move big, heavy things like me. And, <laughs> it, yes. and it's got, it's you know, I talk, you know, you talk about a lack of efficiency. It's got 5.7 litres of aluminum V8 <laughs> in the front of it. Which, Unreal. However, whichever way you cut the deck is excessive, but wonderful. <laughs> so, yeah, hey. But no, I, I love a car-based ute. And now mm. I think some of the, the Santa Cruz is a really good example of what might be. You know, yes, that, that could be a really interesting vehicle. I suppose the only uh, point there is if uh, by whatever circumstance, either or both of those cars make it to the Australian market. So I understand they're both front wheel drive. So they're, they're going to be about your more lifestyle. Um, yeah. You won't be able to tow a whole lot. I'm sure the payload would be okay, but it, it, there's that. Um, yeah, that's right. But, but for, the, for the 99% of time, when the only thing in the tray is yeah. a pair of thongs and an esky. <laughs> yeah, good they're going to be fine. You know, yeah. you don't need to be hauling around two, uh, wow. one live axle and, and one driven front axle. And you, you don't need all that stuff most of the time. Most people. Mm -hmm. lot being being in lockdown, that sounds so appealing. Just an esky and a pair of thongs <laughs> in the back of you you and going somewhere. I love the thought of that. Okay. Um, now let's shift on to the next tasty little Toyota that a lot of people have been, uh, you know, licking their lips over in, in the last couple of years, which of course is the GR Yaris and created an enormous amount of interest, particularly when it was pitched at a lower drive away price to start with and, and kind of batches of cars were sold. It was very much uh, the, the buzz for a while. That's, that's come down a little bit, primarily because I think Toyota have put a temporary pause on, on order taking for the car. Mm -hmm. um, until who knows when, as as Byron says. So what you do have just coming around the corner is the perennial kind of rally-based favourite, the new WRX. Um, that's going to be a fifth-generation Rex, um, and it's penciled in for the first quarter of 2022. And if history is any guide, and I'm sure it'll be pretty accurate in this case, there'll be an STI version after that for people that want even more performance. It's going to have a new engine, 2.4 litre, as we understand it, fresh turbo petrol it's a boxer of course 220 kilowatts um, that's 10 percent more than the current car you'll be able to get a six-speed manual as well as an allegedly improved version of of the cvt so um you know by autumn next year uh byron theorizes that you'll be thinking the gr yaris is so 2020 <sighs> that the wrx will be the one to have tung starting with you what do you make of that as an alternative gr gr yaris is a really interesting case right um, you know, we talked earlier about, uh, you know, the brand appeal of Toyota and, and, you know, 10 years ago, there was no brand appeal of Toyota, was there? It, you know, I would argue that it was things like GR Yaris, GR Supra, uh, that have made things super exciting again for Toyota and have yes. turned more attention onto that brand. Yes. Um, now in terms of like an alternative for GR Yaris, I don't think you need, you know, all wheel drive uh, and that much power out of a, out of a small hatchback like that. Um, I would, I would personally pick Ford Fiesta ST uh, and potentially, you know, the new Hyundai i20N is uh, by all accounts from overseas reports, like looking like a really good pocket rocket as well. That's a great uh, point. Yeah. You, you still get a manual uh, gearbox. Uh, you know, it's still heaps of fun around the corners. Um, and unlike the GR Yaris uh, with the Fiesta ST, you get rear doors, you know? Well, there, well there, Dave, there's a lot of things that we don't need, yet we still want. Um, and I mean, it's interesting talking that you, you raise the ST Fiesta. For me, that's the threshold for a car that you can enjoy just traveling from one set of traffic lights to the next. You know, it's, mm -hmm. it's very much a city fun car anything more than that, and it's overkill. But people love the Rex. Um, it may not make sense in a pragmatic uh, kind of common sense kind of way, but emotionally, uh, people really attach to it. So, Dave, if you were confronted with GR Yaris or I might be able to get a WRX sooner, what, where do you stand on that? The GR Yaris, to me, I, it, this is purely personal. It still <laughs> looks... <laughs> Enough. It's, <laughs> it still looks fish and price to me. <laughs> okay. Yeah, right. It really right. does. It's Barbie's. It's like it should have a handle hat. coming off the back of it, yeah, the seat yeah. on the top, so you can. Yeah. yeah. Barbie's my first hot hat. You know. I, I, wow. Yeah. 
I don't know. I can't get around it. That said, I don't think yep. the Fiesta ST is much tougher looking, but I mm. love that car. That, oh. and, and the original Fiesta ST T yeah, was magical. Yeah, I'm going to buy one of those. Yeah, yeah right. I've said you and me both. I don't know when. <laughs> yep. When I win the lotto, but I'm going to buy one. And yeah, yeah. That was just that car, that original ST with the four cylinder engine, was absolutely more than the sum of its parts. It was. It should it was. not have worked as well as it did. Yeah, true. Now, to me, anything, once you get to a, a product that is more than the sum of its parts, mm. you have just created art. You're right. It was alchemy, <laughs> wasn't it? There, you, that's a great way to describe you, it. It's you look at a, you look at a Van Gogh. It's just oil on canvas, but yeah. with a frame, if you're lucky. Yes. I said it wouldn't have a frame. Uh, <laughs> but it's art because it's more than the sum of its parts. And that's true. The and and mm. Ford has got such a great... See, we come back to heritage. You're talking about the, the, the Toyota emotional experience. Ford, no one, no other car maker really has a mortgage on blue collar hot rod little cars than mm. Ford. and that goes yeah, true. right back. Right well, back. maybe that's a, that's that's the other alternative that the WRX is a bridge too far. That's more of the same. It's it's all wheel drive. It's got the big big power. Um, maybe something like that ST I, is, yeah, is yeah. a better alternative. I, I love the idea of the of the Rex. I've always liked Rexes, and and mm. these days you have to buy the the STI because you. You have to. You just have to. Um, <laughs> but when it, when when the new SDI became the price of the old WRX, who cares? Yeah. Um, yeah. I even like the, the the one that they launched about eight years ago, uh, seven years ago. Uh, it rode like a dray, but that's a yeah. real thing, you know. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, but it was it was a good fun car. I think the new one will be good too. But I think that's going to appeal to a different kind of buyer. You know, there's mm. people there's people for whom a hot hatch. Uh, has to remain within certain parameters to remain. Yeah, I use Shamoz. I'll use another one. <laughs> you know, yep. remain yep. kosher. A hot hat should be front drive. It. Thank you. Blah 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 blah. There's a whole range of things that it has to conform to to be pucker. Yeah, it's interesting. You you mentioned you used the phrase. It's a WRX thing, and I think that's really telling when it comes to the Rex. There are people. There are things that WRX buyers want. Yes. And they want that very taut suspension. They're not so worried about the comfort and the compliance. They want it to be really taut. Yep. They don't want linear power delivery. They want oh. that whoosh of the turbo. They want it to want it come on. at them in a rush. They, they there are various yep. attributes of the Rex yep. that if you if you look at it just across the book, oh, yeah, it, it's a Rex thing. I think as that sums it up. As long as it's got a plug to charge your, your vape. They will sell. Oh, come on. <laughs> yeah. Now, come on, Tony. You're very harsh. Very harsh. Now, um, all right, let's 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 finish it off. The last one that uh, Byron's called out, and we secretly think that's because he actually wants to talk about the alternative more, more than um, anything else, um, is the Fortuna. Now, the Fortuna has been almost a problem child for, for Toyota. It's They've crammed the market with Land Cruiser, Prado, Land Cruiser, Fortuna. You know, on it goes so many uh, sizable SUVs. So what Byron's saying is that you might want to think about the 2022 Isuzu MUX. Um, and it's just been launched. It's got all of this extra driver assist type active safety. Um, interior design and packaging has been improved. So he's seeing that as the solid option relative to Fortuna. And I don't disagree with him at all. I, I, it, it, to me... Um, looks like a fantastic package, particularly given the D Max has been so well received. Also, yeah, mm. See, it's it's weird. I, I am definitely not the buyer type. You know, I am a you know I have a wife and a small baby. Why am I looking at a seven seat you know off road SUV? Sure, sure. So none of those cars actually appeal to me. Fortuna, Everest, MUX, uh, Pajero Sport. I don't see the appeal of them. I think they're all overkill. All know? right. Yep. Yep. So you know, but they've yeah they've got their market. I mean. It feels like Toyota's just got one too many in that space. Mm -hmm. um, but anyway, um, now, Dave, before yeah. we leave the subject of Toyota, please give us a thumbnail breakdown on the car that's behind you um, as we speak. Okay. I'm a big, uh, I was a big Peter Williamson fan. But, you know, the Bathurst Salikas. The, Fantastic. The first car in the world to carry race cam, which was an Australian. Rising sun on the roof. And Wasn't that always correct. the thing? Yes, correct. yes. Yeah. He was a Sydney Sydney Toyota dealer, and he raced very successfully. And he won his class in the under two litre class at Bathurst countless times. This car behind me is the second gen Salika. It's an RA40. Uh, it's a hard top. And I bought it, oh, 
oh, three or four years ago out of a shed uh, where it had been sitting, um, waiting for a uh, divorce settlement to be concluded. <laughs> so mm. it's sat for about is, 13 which, years. <laughs> which sadly is always a, a, a rich field of opportunity when it yeah, comes to the, car purchasing. The, the guy just said, look, I've got to get rid of it. Yeah. I've, I've, got, I've, I've got to buy her a new footpath or something and, and oh, you know, oh. I've got to sell it. So he sold it and I and I, I didn't beat him up on the price. But they, they weren't worth much then anyway. They're still not. Uh, but since then, I've changed the wheels and tyres. I've redone the suspension. I've stripped the interior. It's got one race seat. It's got a bare floor. I made a dog leg short shifter for it. It's got a twin cam engine. <laughs> I've done, a bit of, I've done a little bit of work to it. It's unreal, uh, and it's mm. and it's um it's a lot of fun, and it's it's a really visible. It's one of those hot, purely by fluke. It's one of those high impact cars that people will walk past the Royal Ferraris to look at this thing. Yeah. Unreal, yeah, and I bet, it's, I bet. Know, it's it's just astounding what what sort of um and everyone loves it. No one hates it. Well, the the other thing is anyone apart from, apart that knows <laughs> anyone that knows you or knows of you realizes that's not your only car, and we could do an entire podcast on your fleet. But that is a very uh, a very interesting car. Thank you for that update. We no. will now move on to our garage, having uh, having uh, wet people's appetites with that one. But Tung, yep, we're talking about um, in these COVID constrained times, casting your memory back to a wonderful occasion that has somehow lodged in your memory. Uh, yep. around a car, but it could be all kinds of things that uh, are meaningful for you. Fill us in on yours, please. I, you know, When you asked me to sort of uh, put some thoughts together for this, the first thing that, one of the first things that jumped out in my mind was um, was the launch of the, the Hyundai i30N um, back a few years ago. And, you know, this was, this was such a monumentous thing for Hyundai. It was their first real, you know, hot hatch. Um, they had gotten, you know, people like Albert Bierman to, to come aboard yeah. and, and, and develop this car. You know, they had used the Nürburgring uh, test track to, you know, fine tune suspension and all that. It was, uh, it was a huge deal for them. And, um, uh, you know, you guys would know, oftentimes you, you go on a car launch and they kind of give you, ah, oh, you know, here's two hours in a car, drive down the freeway, you know, park up at the, the hotel and we'll see you for dinner. And that's all the drive time you get. But Hyundai was so confident in this car, so confident that, you know, at the, the, the presentation, they said, this is going to come with a track coverage. The warranty covers track use, non-time track use. And I remember all the journalists just going, this is insane. Like, you know, there's only Porsches really that do this sort of thing. Um, but, you know, we, we, we took their word for it. And, uh, you know, on the day we, we drove, it was, uh, the launch was held out up in Aubrey. Okay. Um, and for the day, you know, we drove around, you know, Victoria, New South Wales, country, country B roads. And we were driving. I remember being in the car from, from 9 a.m. and not coming back to the hotel until 6 p.m. Wow. We drove that car like flat out nonstop for about nine hours with the only break being for lunch. Right. And, uh, and then what really blew me away was that the next day we drove the cars from Albury down to Winton. The very next day. Oh, and then you had a fang on the circuit. And then we had a fang on the circuit. And for about uh, for half the day, we drove the cars around and around and around <laughs> the track. And the best part of it Unreal. is, you know, at the end of it all, Hyundai were like, here are the keys. Can you drive this car back down to Melbourne for us? Yeah. And I just blasted down the Hume yeah. after, you know, two days of absolutely flogging these cars and, you know, nothing broke. Uh, nothing broke down. It was still running as well as it was, you know, the day that so we, what, what, we got the So what, what were your expectations going in and then how had they been met, exceeded or otherwise afterwards? And, you know, did it shift your world in terms of where Hyundai sits in the, in the pantheon of brands? Yeah, 100%. I think, right. you know, it's very tough. Like, we're journalists. We're cynical by nature, right? You know, so when a well, car I don't brand... I don't agree with that. Yeah. <laughs> Well, I am cynical by nature. And when a car brand tells me something, um, uh, you know, I, I don't take their word for it. You know, I think, you know, how much of this is marketing? How much of this is, you know, you trying to put out a positive message? Um, and for Hyundai to back up what they say in such a uh, comprehensive way, um, you know, that's, that's what yeah. blew me away. And yeah. absolutely, it, it changed my estimation of Hyundai. I would love to buy an i30N. I walked away from that launch going, at one point in my life, I think I need to own one of these cars. Right. Well, your yeah. garage is lining up. So you've got a Fiesta ST, then you've got an <laughs> I30N. Um, yeah. It's already taking shape. That's perfect. Yeah. Um, thank you. That sounds amazing, Tool. Good one. Now, Dave, 
Mm. You've you've got the chops here in terms of uh, opening up your horizons in terms of where your your adventures may take you. So you yeah. give us give us one of your motorcycle ones and then and then finish it off with a bit of a car one. Well, look, I've always said that the, one of the reasons I love cars and motorbikes is because they can take you places. And in I'll preface this by saying in a in the current world that we live in, so many experiences are electronic. You know, the telephone you can talk to people without getting out of your pajamas. Television you can see things without leaving your lounge room. The internet you can God knows the limits to that without leaving home. The car and the motorbikes the opposite because it's what that's the one that really takes you to to the places and see them for yourself. So that's always been my shtick. Um, so a few years ago, uh, a few mates and I built motorcycles here and we shipped them to Greece and we rode the Silk Road, which fantastic uh, yeah. across Turkey, Iran, um, Turkmenistan, Uzbekistan, Tajikistan, Kyrgyzstan, Kazakhstan, Russia, Mongolia, back into Russia, across Siberia and down to Vladivostok. So you automatically win the trivia question when it is name eight countries ending with Stan. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Amazing. Yeah. I, I yeah. haven't been to Pakistan yet, but I'm working There's on it. There you go. Yeah. So it was 22,000 Ks. It took us three months. Wow. It was a big commitment. It was a big chunk of the year. Uh, and that's, you know, not counting the, the, the time we put in in the lead up. Although we did keep the planning fairly simple. Um, yes. And we elected to ride from from west to east and i'm not making it because you can do it either way i'm yeah. not making this up we did it that way so that we wouldn't have the sun in our eyes every afternoon fair enough fair <laughs> enough you don't want to be squinting the whole time That's exactly right you miss too much and and in building the bikes what were your priorities you were going to be dealing with i suspect variable fuel or, yeah, or, re or... reliability obviously yeah. because uh, yeah. um I, I chose a bike with an air-cooled engine so it mm. could get a rock yep. through the radiator uh, yep. no fuel injection so it would, yep. was a carburetor. It would run on the sort of fuel we were buying out of people's back sheds. Mm. Uh, you put a you put a handkerchief over your fuel cap over your fuel uh, opening just to keep the. Oh wow! Yeah, yeah right. It was, it was rubbish, and the bikes wow. the bikes suffered. You know, sometimes. And the other thing was, we're at uh, at, at one point we we're at four thousand seven hundred meters on the Pamir Highway in uh, yep. in Tajikistan, wow. looking, looking into Afghanistan. Across the river. So your carburation is going all over the place it, with it the altitude. Gone to hell. And yeah. for a lot of the time we're at sea level. So it was a huge range wow. to get a bike for. Uh, I chose a bike with a steel frame because you can't weld aluminium without TIG. Yep. And yep. all of Mongolia, there's not a TIG welder. <laughs> oh, wow. And I know that. Wow. I got stuck. Uh, and I saw a lot of exotic adventure bikes stranded in places like cities like Osh in, in Kyrgyzstan. And mm. the guys just had to fly home. He's going to come back and get it next year with the past uh, needs because you know goodbye there's holiday over you know yeah yeah mm. yeah, um, yeah wow well so, that's it the, the yeah. planning um so much underpins the execution of the adventure doesn't it uh, uh, that you, yeah. you can't underestimate that there, there again you, until you know what you're up against it's very hard to plan for it i mean yeah you know some of, those, some of those stand countries after the ussr imploded uh tajikistan for instance was plunged into 10 years of civil war Mm, and right. they're only just coming out of that. So, yeah, you know, there's towns in in the desert in Tajikistan where every flat surface of a roof is covered in camel dung because right. it's drying because that's yeah. what you cook on. That's wow. what you burn to cook on. I mean, this is this is serious, Mum. You know, this is yeah. We, we, were you as an envoy able to calm any of those uh, goings on <laughs> on your way through, Dave? Or, or... no, no. Um, in fact. Po quite possibly the opposite. <laughs> we did get stopped a lot by the police, particularly in Iran. We would get stopped uh, pretty much daily because we were yeah. very visible. Four big blokes on four big bikes. Yeah. Clearly not from around here. Dave, can I ask about the physicality of it? You know, I've had very limited experience with bikes in the past, but to me, riding across all those countries over three months, you know, it sounds very physically demanding. Oh. I used to be a supermodel and look at me now. That's what it's, that's what it's done. <laughs> now you do, you do get um, your backside becomes pretty. Oh, the, that was the other thing I did. I repadded the seat on my bike. Yeah. Because I knew there would be long days. Just as critical to the seat comfort is how you load the bike. Um, you need to have the weight potentially as low as possible, but centralized as much as possible too. So 
Um, it's it's your mass center of mass versus your center of gravity. But at the same time, you're going to be riding through rivers. And mm. in Mongolia, the main road doesn't have bridges. It's got water crossings. <laughs> um, the And there's a lot of sand. In, in Iran, we did a lot of desert riding, a lot of sand. Now, if you can't, if your bike is packed such that you can't stand up on the pegs, mm. sand, you, you've you already crashed. You, you have to get your weight up and back and power on. And uh, yeah, that can be pretty confronting. By the time you get to a fairly long patch of sand, you can be doing a fairly high rate of knots. So Yeah, right. Yeah. I've lost you, James. Oh, I think, JC, you just, you're on mute. You've muted, mate. Oh, that was clever. No, all I was going to say was, so you're you're upping the speed, but you're also upping the ante in terms got, of the risk to, if if something goes wrong. Yeah, you've got to keep the front wheel light, otherwise it's going to it's going to dig in and flop over, and and it's wow. game over. So yes, but you're up in the stakes because you're going so much faster by the time you get to the end of it. And and right. there, there was places where you just couldn't do that. And at that stage, it's first gear, feet down, paddle through the sand. Wow. Or, or wow. an hour at a time. It's quite quite soul destroying when that happens, but. You know what a way to see. I, I I still say the best way to see the world is from the seat of your own motorcycle, and I'll, I'll precisely. Well, there's nothing in the way, is there? I mean, you, uh, you're uh, you're absolutely in the environment. You are, and you know the result. The, the flip side of that is you're very vulnerable. But yeah, um, yeah. gee whiz, what a trip, you know. I, I, and look, that is amazing. And just finish this off with a quick car one. I think we spoke about yeah, it pre-show. Um, yeah, it's a, it's a medical emergency story. Uh, my mum a few years ago had to have a kidney transplant. Right. And she was living in Albury, still is, and yep. I was in Melbourne. And she rang me and she said, they've got a kidney for me. I'm about to, they're about to do a transplant. I need to be picked up at the airport. Now, I don't know anything about kidney transplants other than the fact that time is critical. Sure. And I happen to have an Evo 10. Right. <laughs> so I picked my, my dear grey-haired mother up at the airport in an Evo 10 and I had her at the hospital in fairly smart order. Wow. I don't think, was I don't she, think, I don't think she, too many trips like that. Was she operating the rally halder while you went there? You were checking <laughs> stages off as you got. Uh, she was navigating. Yeah. Uh, wow. It was, it was, um, uh, thankfully, it was the cameras were turned off that day. I don't know. I don't know how. Unreal. It was. Unreal. And I got her there, and she had the kidney transplant. It was an absolute success, and she's still living independent. Fabulous. That's fabulous. Uh, so you know, if if, if it's a business done nothing else, they built the Evo Ten and which allowed and helped your mum. Um, exactly. That is that is amazing. Thank you, Dave. Um, I'm going to finish off with um, look. It's a car, and it was a time and a thing that I did in the car. Um, I've got this little collection of fifty diecasts that represent you know memorable drives and things. And one of them uh, is a Holden Monaro HG GTS 350. Now, it's not a car that I owned. It's a car that a friend, an acquaintance, um, I think his, his father was primarily in um, import-export, if you know what I mean, uh, colourful racing identity. <laughs> and at the same time, he, he was generally in some fairly flash cars at that point. But it's, of course, the, the small block 350 um, in there, four-speed uh, auto. It was the first car that I did 100 miles an hour in. So um, it, back, back in the day, 100 miles an hour, the ton, it was a big deal. And I remember thinking, wow, I've gone 100 miles an hour for the first time. And it wasn't on race circuit. I'm not saying where it was, but it was an, an interesting location. And that car, to me, was... It was pre my time, but I knew very well of Norm Beachy, and I know in the times when Brock drove Monaros and Colin Bond and what have you at Bathurst. So to do it in that car was really special. And afterwards, I was thinking, "Wow, oh, that's uh, that's awesome." So it's in it's in my little collection, and that was a, a memorable day and a memorable car. And I still at, at things like Auto Classica and and when you get around to those and you see an HG GTS three fifty, I always think, "Ah, oh, that's <laughs> that's that's the one." I know the HK is the iconic one, and and all of that, but I love the HG because um, it was that car that day. Yeah. All right. Now, let's continue on to a bit of feedback. And last week, we were talking about China's next generation. There's been this first whack of Chinese cars that have come in and made their impact on the new car market, not least of which being MG, which is, which is now a regular top 10 contender in terms of sales. Um, and there was a lot of reluctance to consider a Chinese vehicle um, for reasons related to the products and some to geopolitics, um, and that, that can't be denied. But Stendek Stretcher said, due to the shortage of Korean and Japanese cars, my son and daughter-in-law have both bought MGs, 
very happy with price, quality, and availability. So it'd be interesting, Stendek. Keep us keep us posted as to how they go over time. Obviously, the um, the first flush is is looking good, but by comparison, Varun Menon said never trust Chinese made products, and Michael McCown said not much in your house then, Varun. And planes, trains, and dogs and cars said you won't be going to Bunnings then. And Michael McGowan came back and just said, look, just for the sausage and a quick U-turn. So um, it, it's true, you know, it, it's, almost, it's almost all pervading that, that China outside of the, the auto category um, is dominant in terms of stuff produced and stuff that we buy, sometimes in the full knowledge that it comes from China and sometimes we're blissfully unaware. But I suppose in the, in the car market, it's, it's the former. We, we know what we're buying and there seems to be um, some hesitancy there at the moment still. It's a very pragmatic view, isn't it? The, the, the good points of, those, of that car for that, for that person was its reliability, its price mm-hmm. and its availability. Correct. It's pragmatic view. And it's, you know, it's like the old question, what do you find attractive in women? Well, attainability. <laughs> 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 you know, it, it can be the best of its type, but if you can't get hold of it, that's true. Well, it's it's very much what we were talking about earlier, wasn't it? You know, as alternatives to to Toyota. So um, these how people much, have turned turned around, bought an MG. How much further do you break that down? You know, like sure, a car might be manufactured in Germany or the US or Japan or Thailand or wherever, but are all those components also made there, or are no, they no. you know made do, in places you know, like China? Rightly or wrongly, I always thought it was a very clever idea when BMW struck on the thought of our cars are built in BMW. Hmm. Right, so wherever they've set up a facility, that car's built in BMW. It doesn't matter whether it's South Africa, it doesn't matter whether it's Germany, China. We have these standards that we do our best to apply no matter where these things are built. I thought that was a good thought. Whether or not they're able to actually deliver on it, people will have their opinion. But I, I think that ambition um, is an interesting one. Yeah, I can see why they did that too because, you know, if you look at um, uh, the Australian market even, how many people from 1987 to 2016 bought a Toyota Camry thinking it was a Japanese car. <laughs> totally. Totally. It was built around the corner, you know? Well, it was the thing. It's that it was the inverse problem for yeah, Toyota when, yeah. when local manufacturing stopped. They'd been spending decades trying to convince people that they were a local manufacturer and no one really cottoned on. While for Holden, ultimately, it was their destruction. Ford, it was a big deal. Toyota, it was like water off a duck's back because no one thought they built cars here anyway. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. All right. Now, then, our next commenter, Digifish, said, where the Chinese are about to dominate, and it seems blindside the Australian market, is the EVs. Just look at what BYD, Ziping, NIO, WM Motors, etc., are doing. The Chinese can make cars today that are 20K cheaper than anything incumbent brands can match. This will make what the Japanese and then Koreans did to the US market look quite tame. So he's predicting um, that this push is not temporary, that it's uh, symptomatic of something that will continue and only grow. Um, and you'd have to think once, the, once the, 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 the doors cracked open, yeah, everyone else uh, follows through, you know? Well, I think the same thing happened 20 years ago with Hyundai or the South Korean brands. Yeah, yeah. You know, I remember driving the very first Hyundai Sonata Mm. oh man mm. it, it had a collar and drank from a bowl it was uh, you know, yes all yes. of a sudden now you know i mean i don't know about you but i recommend south korean cars to people all the time true it's, and they're, they're in the consideration set completely valid option absolutely. along any other brand and that and, hasn't taken that long you know well dave the the flip side of that is and i've mentioned it a few times in the podcast forgive me but visiting the ulsan plant in successive decades mm. was incredible that yes. the first visit was like medieval. Uh, oh. you know, it, it was frightening. Charles open, Dickens couldn't have invented that place. Open fires and, yeah. you know, it was amazing. And then you just went back and it was cleaner and slicker and robots and yeah. on it went. That that leap was commensurate with, you know, the improvement in the product. So, uh, yeah, it's been extraordinary. However, um, I, think, I think it's an interesting point that the, 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 our respondent says, oh, well, they can do it for 20 grand less. I put it to you that Toyota could build a car for 20 grand less than they charge now but what would it be like that's interesting that's a really interesting point well his acde says only a few chinese manufacturers are worthy of consideration that's his view her view others others never think about making products to an international standard much less exporting them 
Um, they're stuck in the domestic market, relying on government subsidies to survive. Many brands, especially state-owned ones, have no soul. His uh, words, not ours. So, now, so I suppose that's the difference, isn't it? That you're making what is just white goods on wheels. We don't really know what this is. We'll, we'll just do what others have done and, and make a, a thing. Whereas others have become auto manufacturers and understand that there is some emotion and some engineering dynamism and some need for, for the car to be a bit more, as you said earlier, Dave, than the sum of its parts. Mm. Um, he suggests never, capital letters, buy these products. Uh, don't be cheated by words like innovation, world leading, et cetera. MG's products are meaningless. Just check their fuel consumption and you'll realise the, atti the attitude. They came along in Australia, even in China, it is not a popular brand either. So I suspect that ACDE may be coming to us from China. Um, and that's his view, that there are a bunch of brands there that never think about exporting, but some have crossed over and, and done just that. Okay, the problem with that argument is that why would, why would the Chinese have bothered to buy the MG brand unless they were trying to gain some global traction? Mm. Yep. I, don't think, yep. I, I, can, I can understand that MG might not mean anything to, to a Chinese audience because they're first generation car owners a lot of them yeah so so the, the heritage of mg means nothing so mm. why do you buy mg to get a foothold in in export markets yes so it kind, kind of defeats that argument for me yeah I, yep, I, under, yep. I fully understand that if, if you were starting from scratch and you had government support and you had a billion people in into which you know a market of a billion people into which to launch your product you might not give a stuff about exports i can mm. see true that, you know true well, that's, that's it. I mean, that's the challenge, I suppose, when you are a BYD or a Zpeng or a Neo or a WM Motors. They're, they're all completely from starting from scratch. Mm. They're, 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 they're not known names. They have to build that awareness. They have to build some integrity into what they stand for to be able to sell outside the domestic market. Um, right now, Birdie and Jim, Jim Danik made the same point that it was this progression. You know, Japan, which was really the late 50s into the 60s, early 70s was seen as a, a questionable choice, became utterly mainstream. Um, Korea from the early 80s through into the mid 90s, same deal, now completely mainstream. And they're both theorizing that China will do the same and will get used to it. So there's all this initial uh, reluctance, but inevitably um, it won't be a factor. And I think they're, they're pretty right. The writing's on the wall. I do too. And, I, and mm. I'll tell you why. If the Japanese manufacturers and brands made it in australia anyone can you know for yeah. all that for all that there's suspicion of the chinese government there's the you know the, the geopolitical reasons you were talking about japanese cars became a thing now it wasn't long before that they bombed the chip shop in darwin you know <laughs> that's true that's true <laughs> it's, and i only learned the other day in broome as well mind you there yeah. were there were uh, attacks in broome i didn't know yes. that but anyway yeah. Um, yes, so that's a very, very good point. Um, people do, I think, also in commercial terms, have a relatively short memory. Um, but yes. planes, trains and dogs and cars chipped in again and said, to see how far the Chinese have come, check out the Hi-Fi X. And ACDA, who we suspect is coming to us from China, actually said, what's a Hi-Fi X? And I had exactly the same question in mind. And it is, in fact, pronounced Hi-Fi and their main product is a six-seat battery electric crossover with suicide doors and a flip-top roof panels at the back. And for those looking, uh, watching on YouTube, we'll have some vision of this car. It looks amazing. Um, whether it makes it uh, to, to this market would be very interesting, but um, quite an out-there design. De Kook, our old mate De Kook, has suggested that leasing deals might be a good way for Chinese brands to overcome these potential reliability worries, you know, offer a Z MGZS for something like $100 a week with rego and insurance uh, to increase the car park and lift awareness. And then you might do something like Ford does in the States and offer an upgrade to a higher category, like Ford will give you a Mustang for two weeks of summer instead of your leased Escape, which is a really lovely kind of custom customer loyalty thing. Um, you could nurture a lot of loyalty and, and get people into the brand. I think it's an interesting idea. Raise, raise the profile. I mean, MG is a, a top 10 brand now. You know, they're outselling True. Subaru. Do they, you know, need to raise the profile more? Maybe. I mean, I'm sure they have aspirations on a higher number than 10 um, in, in the sales charts. Sorry, I, I bet, Tom, if you, if you went down to a shopping centre and asked people, there'd be a certain, a, a reasonable percentage of people who don't know that MG is even a thing anymore. 
So yeah, I think while while people who are actively shopping understand that they're here and have showrooms, if you're not, then I I suspect they're not front of mind for for a lot of people. They're yes. not they're not even acknowledged as a player. Yes. All right. Now, and we'll finish this off with uh, the incredibly named Geo bloke. He says, um, look, I love the intro music. I reckon that's the song my, un- my uncle had in his head after a dozen tins at my cousin's wedding. <laughs> and, uh, yeah, well, I'm glad you love it, Geo Bloke. Thank you. And uh, we will continue to play it uh, for each episode of the podcast. But with that, amazingly, we have reached the finish line. So I want to say thanks for joining, Dave. My, my pleasure, mate. Good and fun. thank you. And thank you, Tom. It's been real. Good, and thanks to our podcast visionary, head of evidence shredding and weekend golf ball diver, Mr. Pritchard, for his mastery of the audiovisual arts. Today, he's dressed as a balloon poodle, which makes things a bit tricky in the production suite, but you've got to respect his fashion freedom. It's amazing. Jump into the conversation. Cars Guide is on Facebook and Instagram, or email us at comments at carsguide.com.au. Apple Podcast listeners, please take a moment to rate and review the show. Please do it. Five stars would be great. Uh, Thank you. Uh, If you enjoyed the episode, make sure you subscribe to the Cars Guide YouTube channel so you can stay on top of all our latest content. But before we go, look, thanks to COVID, a bloke I know through the car club has been caught in Switzerland for about 18 months, and he's just made it back to Australia. Um, despite the delay uh, coming home, he reckons he had a good time. I said to him, you know, what is it about Switzerland that that you like so much? He said, it's hard to put my finger on it, but the flag's a big plus. (laughs) Dear, oh dear. (laughs) I really like that one. (laughs) I can tell. Oh, my God.